super to have you here today. I am very fortunate to uh, call Kathy Jets my friend, uh, but she is um, a author and a really well sought after speaker. If you are part of a garden club and or some organization that hires professional speakers, she like I uh, speak and are part of a, a big professional association called Garden Calm. Uh, she also is the um, editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, which is a really fabulous source of information if you're ever looking for uh, uh, really good information about what's going on in the Mid-Atlantic. And she has a uh, podcast as well. So she is an extremely busy lady and a tiny bit under the weather today. So we're really thrilled to have you here. And uh, I love all your books, but this one's super timely for me about the ground cover revolutions. So I'm really curious what inspired you to write this book. Yeah, so um, as Heather said, you can probably hear it. <laughs> that I, I came down with the virus in the last few days, so I got my high, hot tea next to me and my cough drop in my hand, and just in case I have to uh, get that for a coughing fit. But um, in answer to your question, Ground Cover Revolution came around from my personal journey in the garden, where I went from a condo to a small home when I decided I needed more gardening space, but I inherited uh with that small home a huge amount of grass turf grass lawn and i've never had to mow like that in my life especially on an urban corner straight up and down on the little mm. uh, and that was not safe basically no. if i let go of that mower it was in traffic <laughs> <laughs> any degree boop into traffic and it's i didn't usually frowned upon when you take out your neighbors with the mower they they yeah. don't like that I was like, this This is for the birds. No, uh, why am I maintaining this lawn? That was for my first year and I was like, I'm gonna get rid of all of this lawn. I want things that spread fast, that really cover it up. And that's when I decided uh, to just jump into the world of ground cover as an experiment. And I ripped out all the turf grass lawn at once. Wonderful. Um, and I don't recommend other people do that. <laughs> it was a little crazy, a little over ambitious. But because of that, I was able to do tons of experiments from full sun to full shade and see what worked best um, across all those different zones and give some lessons that I impart in the book. And I think we probably should disclose where you live so that, because not everybody is gonna be from the Mid-Atlantic. So can you, can you tell people your zone and uh, sure. what your conditions are where your uh, ground covers now live? Yeah, so I am, right on the Washington DC, Maryland border. So just, I, I call it a few miles north of the White House, directly up the diamond. And I am zone seven. We have pretty heavy clay soils. I am a little bit raised above some of my neighbors and the rest, like I, I described that little slope. So I am blessed with good drainage. That's one good thing. But then I also have a lot of dry shade because of huge oaks behind my house. So those roots have to be worked with and that's a condition that's similar to a lot of people, I think. The book is aimed uh, internationally, so it's being published globally. Um, so I do talk about various growing zones, although in the book we don't do USDA hardiness zones, we do temperature ranges. Right. So that if you're in South Africa, or if you're in Europe, you're not gonna be like, what's USDA zone seven mean? Right. <laughs> that wouldn't mean much to you, but the temperature range of that plant will help you a lot. Absolutely. So you brought up a couple of really compelling things. So clearly those of us who have slopes, very, very difficult situation to garden. And I think ground covers are a really nice solution because as you said, it's it's not only dangerous for you uh, if you're operating a piece of equipment, but potentially who's downhill of you. So um, what was your strategy there? You said you got rid of the turf grass. Can you talk about a little bit about that process? Yeah, so I was also looking for not just to get rid of the maintenance, which is a big reason why we want ground covers, but I wanted to beautify the corner. It had just been like blah before, and I wanted to benefit wildlife. So I was looking for ground covers that did all of those things. So on the sunny slope right there on that corner, I sourced some ground cover roses. 
Um, and that was about 15 years ago. And ground cover roses have really advanced in the last five years I found. So I've got some of those new ones in the book. But the ones I used back then were from the Meadland roses, some French ground cover roses. So I plant them at the top of the slope and they kind of just kind of tuck their way down the slope and hold it in, uh, which is great. Um, and forms this like hedge almost all the way around the corner. So you just have to keep it pruned back from the sidewalk. But just with the constant traffic and passing by, that was normally happening. Plus benefited pollinators look great, except for in the dead of winter, not so pretty. <laughs> so, but other than that, um, because we have a four season climate here, um, if it was a more Mediterranean climate, probably your ground cover roses will look great all year round. Sure, sure. And certainly in the mid-Atlantic, we're deciduous forests, so almost everything loses its leaves uh, in the winter time. And so you're looking for things like bark or other color, colorful, maybe stems or something that are interest in terms of texture. But you also mentioned that you have dry shade and especially under those oak trees. And certainly Doug Tallamy talks about the importance of these soft landings under these oak trees so that mm -hmm. the caterpillars that have been over winter here, uh, which become next year's butterflies, can be, um, you know, have a, a wonderful place to maybe hide. So I'm curious what you used in that dry shade, because that is a real tough area sometimes to plant. Yeah, and, and it all, had all been left to go to English Ivy and Vinca, which oh, are, no. <laughs> <laughs> are ground covers but they're not ones I advocate for in the book. Right. Um, so what I did was I cl would clear a section of that thick vine ground cover and I would plop another ground cover amongst it that was either shade tolerant or drought tolerant and just have them duke it out with each other. Say who could hold off against the ivy, who could hold off against the vinca, either hold its own space or actually spread over it. And I was shocked, Heather, to find that epimediums actually ran over the ivy and Wonderful. own foothold. They're pretty drought tolerant. These are the common epimediums, not your like little collector epimediums. So right. the the five dollar, you know, little quart size one versus the fifty or a hundred dollar. So like a lot of plants that we might mention today, like hostas and other things. You can go really high end or you can go for the more ground cover common types. A absolutely. And certainly, um, you know, you, we're going to be talking about both natives and non-natives today. Um, so uh, because there are certainly advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, but uh, when you are dealing with out competing, I think natives are a really great way to do it because they're from your area. They are born in your soil. They're used to your temperature changes. And by the way, we're going to have frost here tonight in central Pennsylvania. I warned you, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it, people get super excited this time of year to plant things and then that late frost, here it is. So, so I'm curious from your perspective, um, what you found was really great. If you want to have a ground cover, maybe that things can then come up through what are some suggestions that you might have? Yeah, so in the book, I talk about a concept that's that I call leaf swallowing. So those are those ground covers that can take the deciduous leaf drop, kind of take in those leaves, they decay under the, the over of the ground cover, and then it's just swallowed up and you don't have to do the raking, the trees and other plants roots benefit from those decaying leaves looks neat, doesn't blow around, the neighbors aren't upset. So in the book, again, because it's internationally published, we talk about country of origin versus native, but I do have, of course, because I'm an Atlantic person, uh, a lot of natives in there. And so some of the ones that I love, of course, are our Allegheny Spurge, um, which is our Appalachian version of Pachysandra. Yep. The only drawback, Heather, and you know, maybe we can get somebody working on this is how slow it is to spread. <laughs> yeah. It is a slow spread, but once you get a nice good patch going, it comes up, it, you know, to about of a, I would say what, eight, eight to 12 inch height. Looks yep. beautiful for- Doesn't look pretty. 
pollinations, has beautiful flowers, just great for pollinators, great for leaf swallowing. Has this nice kind of like, sh I wouldn't call it a shiny texture versus the, the Japanese or Asian Pakistandra. It kind of has a dustiness to it, yep. but nice green, like backdrop plant yep. that you interweave it under azaleas. You know, if you have your native azaleas, your oak leaf hydrangeas, perfect understory plant for that type of fit situation. Yep. I, I definitely um, love that idea. And I certainly have had really good uh, uh, results with clients um, with mixing in like carexes and other types of sedges uh, under those trees. I recently did one for a client uh, that we did a mixture so that it would give you kind of that symphony of bloom. So lots of phloxes, um, and then some of these spring ephemerals too, like bluebells, things that will quote unquote disappear, right? But are super important for storing carbon, but really important too for those early spring emerging uh, pollinators. But I love what you say about leaf swallowing. Um, I was just out planting some woodland phlox in my uh, area where I've got an oak and a walnut um, underneath. And uh, I, I was noticing that my native uh, ground covers are doing exactly what you're saying. They're holding all those big oak leaves down. They didn't blow away uh, during the winter, but that's so important if you're a butterfly gardener like me or concerned about pollinators because those leaves are holding as next year's butterflies. So, um, so I love that conversation or, 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 or idea of leaf swallowing. So, um, one thing that I get a lot of questions about as people are trying to do what you do and um, are trying to replace the lawn, you know, sometimes they want to go with something like clover. Why would you recommend against that? Um, I do talk about clover as one of the options for lawn replacement, especially if you are, say, an HOA or you have a town ordinance or local government that says, it has to be lawn on the front or what, whatever that ordinance says. So usually it doesn't have to, say, have to be turf grass, but it has to be some type of green lawn choice, in which case clover could be a good one. Um, there are native clovers, there are introduced clovers. So generally the most available is the white clover. Um, that's I believe from Europe and makes a beautiful ground cover makes a great lawn in a sunny area, well drained, doesn't like to sit in water. The only drawback is if you want to run across it and barefoot, you might step on a bee. So, <laughs> so people shy away from it because they're like, oh, my dog might get stung or something like that. In which case, go with micro clover, which only has 10% of the flowers, but still the same coverage. Um, however, then you don't get the pollinator benefit as much. So it's uh, a matter of choice there. If you can go a little taller, uh, the red clovers are much more beneficial, so beautiful, and all the clovers give you some nitrogen fixing in the soil and add back in nutrients. So those are yeah. all traits of the clovers, but yeah, there are a lot of clovers that you can pick between. And Heather, if I can go back to one previous point you made about um, putting your spring ephemerals in amongst your ground covers. I love the idea of bulbs and your spring ephemerals being married with your ground covers because as ground covers are putting out their new growth and new flush, that's when the spring ephemerals and your spring blooming bulbs are dying back. And it's just like such a perfect marriage between those two. And that could even carry into the summer. I love the look of like those drumstick alliums coming up out of her. They just like look like a Dr. Seuss landscape, right? You got carrot, the, you know, that ground cover of Carex and then those big pom poms sticking out. And who doesn't love that? Yeah, I, it's, I've gone absolutely crazy this year with alliums. It is just, your description is exactly how I think about them is that it looks like something out of a back pursuit for sure. So one of the questions I, I have gotten is, uh, how long should I expect for my ground cover flocks to bloom? Um, so there's two different ground cover flocks. Um, I'm gonna assume, so there's the more 
the moss spreading phlox, which is the earlier blooming one. And that looks just like a green carpet of moss. And then it has this little, I always call them like, they look like they're stamped out of confetti flowers. Oh. Um, got a good coverage of that. And then once they start to fade, you can actually shear those back and get a second flush. Oh, it won't great be, idea. Yeah, it won't be as full as that first flush, but you get a second sporadic flush and then shear that off. That's all the maintenance it needs for the year. And I think that's, uh, it's a good three to four weeks. And then if you do that second flush, you get another week or two out of it. It's a great tip. If it's the woodland flocks that you had mentioned earlier using like in dry shade or native woodland one, that's a little bit taller. That's a little bit, um, I'm gonna say two to three weeks of bloom time. And then you kind of just have this green creeping carpet uh, yes. full for the rest of the year. So it's a little bit higher than the moss flocks, uh, but still beautiful as an understory, especially in woodland garden. Hence yeah, the name. That, that blue color is to die for. It's just oh. stunning this time of year. It's really yeah. like a periwinkle blue. Really yeah. pretty. I think one cultivar or native R is Wedgwood Blue, and that's that one is just beautiful. Oh, wow. Uh, I also love that combination too with our native geraniums. Um, I love the shape of the <laughs> geranium leaf, and we've used that extensively in one of our um, trial gardens for Master Gardener um, that we have it on a corner where it just sort of rounds out the edge of the historic home that we maintain. And we mm. have it as well near that woodland flocks. And it's just a really pretty combination of the two uh, because they kind of float almost like a parasol. It's just so, so, so charming uh, to have a lot of those um, and they spread really well. Uh, so it's really fantastic if you've got a, a woodland area that you're looking for, for a nice ground cover. Yeah, I love all the hardy geraniums. So we have native, we have exotic versions, and then there's all the hybrids. Yes. <laughs> it's a big wardrobe to choose from. And they are very hardy. I love the sporadic reblooming as well. Yes. And you get the scent when you're weeding amongst it or brushing by it. So you get that extra benefit for you as well. Right, absolutely. So um, there's a question about scientific names. Uh, Joan, it's tough to do that because we're gonna have lots of different people here, but if you're looking for the scientific names, I will say that uh, they are in the book as well, um, but we can try to do that. And uh, the, the uh, question QA is where we're gonna be answering the questions. So if you can uh, put them there, that would be, be great. Um, and for the uh, folks that missed the first few minutes, uh, this is going to be recorded and replayed on uh, YouTube and we will send a link to that once it's up. Uh, so uh, the question is, and I'm going to say I don't know exactly what you're asking, but I have a ground cover that has gone beyond my needs. Maybe it's too aggressive. Uh, would you suggest that I prune it or remove it and start over? Yeah, I don't know if you would completely start over. I think you assess the situation and if it's starting to go into an area you don't want it, you need to establish some type of boundary or barrier control. Um, you could either use the English um, trenching version where you just go along and cut an edge and you kind of make it like a half uh, moon shape in the soil. Or you can take literal barriers and put them into the ground. So that could be like a court and steel barrier or other weed barrier, or it could be a pathway or whatever that separates that from your other plants. Um, I guess it depends what it is because I will say what I encounter a lot when I'm talking about ground cover revolution is, but that book, but that plant is invasive or that plant is aggressive or that plant is a thug, which I hate that term. Right. But I'm like, well, that's the definition of a successful ground cover <laughs> and suppresses weeds um, or the other plants that you don't want in that area. So there are ratings in the book. I have a little chart section about how well some of the ground covers play with each other. Some are gentler, some are more, I would call it aggressive. Yes. And those are also rated for slower spreading versus faster spreading. So for some of you, you want coverage right away. 
you have like a bare spot that's maybe causing issues. You might have drainage issues or you might just have, like we were describing before, a slope that needs held in right away because you don't want mud coming down or the soil erosion. Or you have more time. You, you might have, say this patch under this oak tree, I can establish the native Pachysandra, the Allegheny Spurge we talked about, and put little plugs in and wait for that to establish over a few years. So those are rated for that as well. Yeah, so um, one of the things that uh, certainly as a garden designer, I'm always trying to make sure that the plants survive once I leave because once I've put them in the ground, I'm, I'm entrusting those <laughs> to my client. Is there a good time of year that you recommend putting ground covers down for the best success? Yeah, for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, early fall establishment to get the roots in there um, and establish before winter is best. Um, you can do so, of course, in the spring, but then the heat of the summer could hold you back a bit and then cause you to have to water extra, extra, extra. And that does bring up the point, Heather, of I hear that fallacy all the time that our native plants don't need to be watered. That's not the case. They have to be watered. <laughs> Down cover is going to need to be watered, even if it says drought tolerant, desert plant, whatever it is, until the roots are established. Yes. So check on it. If you're not getting regular rain uh, or if you need supplemental water, at least for that first year or two, then you can kind of slack off and you can be like, well, we haven't had rain for a few weeks. Let me check on this plant. And But there are, Heather, of uh, several ground covers that I planted here in the Mid-Atlantic that I never watered, not even the first day they went in the ground because no. I filing them and pushing them to their limits to see what would happen. And that included the hardy geraniums we talked about earlier. And I said, okay, you're going to look really sad <laughs> for a few months, but I'm going to see if you will come back from those roots if I do nothing for you. Um, if I'm just like a laissez-faire homeowner gardener and just walk away from it. And some of them have been really puff troopers, and those are a lot of the ones I talk about in the book. But of course, I'm stressing them to the point of almost dying, and that's not an ideal situation for a home garden. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, this is the beauty of ground covers, right? Because it's probably from a design standpoint, one of the last things people think about. They're interested in the trees and the shrubs and the uh, perennials we're going to use, but sort of the ground covers, the afterthought. But really, it's a huge portion of the design from a standpoint of future, having to use less mulch, having to uh, water less, potentially um, providing some of the soft landings that we're talking about that are going to go under those trees to provide habitat for, um, so we don't create those mulch volcanoes that, that uh, you see uh, sometimes from, from landscapers. Um, one of the questions was, is sweet woodruff uh, a good ground cover? Yeah, so that one is a, a great choice, especially if you have not so dry of shade, but shade with a, maybe a little bit of moisture, um, or you can give it a little bit of irrigation to start off with. Um, and then usually it's okay on its own after that. So that is one that is, of course, deciduous. Um, so it will die back in the wintertime and you'll kind of have what I call the mouse graveyard <laughs> in the wintertime. But if you have snow cover, that doesn't matter. Um, but if you're farther south, then you might want to think about another ground cover choice. Yeah. So we've talked about shade, um, and this is certainly one of the things that I deal with on this property, dry shade, but what about wet shade? Yeah. Oh, I envy the wet shade. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so wrong, Heather, so wrong. But. So <laughs> If you are blessed with wet shade, or it could be just like a, a ditch or an area to the back of your garden where everything drains to, you have the whole world of ferns and mosses to explore. And I just love a moss lawn, how beautiful those are. I do have one small moss lawn, like a five foot oval, um, under one of my trees that I maintain, but I do have to give that supplemental water in the hot summertime. And I do have ferns that are more the drought tolerant side of the ferns. 
um, rather than some of the moisture loving ferns. But yeah, if you can get a beautiful moss lawn established, if moss is already trying to take over where your lawn is in a place, that's a big indication lawn is not going to grow there. That's where you're going to put some of the more moisture loving uh, ground covers. And the great thing also about mosses and ferns, there's so many different varieties. There's clumping, there's spreading, there's slower spreading, there's faster spreading, so many different wardrobe. Deer resistant, I will even almost swear to deer proof, you know, except for they like to sleep on them, not so much eat. <laughs> and then uh, just beautiful. And also most of them are green throughout the year. And that certainly brings up one of the challenges here that we have. Uh, Penn's Woods is also deer capital of the world. And so uh, I always have a lot of questions about things that are deer and bunny proof. Uh, critter resistant, we know nothing is really proof. If it's dry, they will eat anything, I'm convinced. Uh, but uh, to your point, that's a good one about ferns. I am noticing uh, I have a, a property I'm doing right now that is uh, very wet and so there's a lot of ferns and the deer don't you're right they don't seem to care about them uh, so curious from your perspective what you would recommend for those of us who have heavy pest pressure yeah so in the book i have little rating systems i don't know how well you can see on the camera there but little deer face with an x over it, it means a deer resistant plant and then on the charts you can go down and look for the different attributes one of them would be deer resistant shade tolerant you know uh, in my temperature zone so i'm going to recommend uh i'm sure you love this native too it's one of my favorites is acerum canadense the wild ginger yes and beautiful beautiful ground cover loves moist deep shade like deep shade i'm talking like we are this black <laughs> into houses where a tree is covering it up and the eaves are not letting any sunshine in that's where you want to put that wild ginger and also where it just sits in wet yeah it just take that can take it and take it and i just love the little tiny flowers that come along the ground. You have to lift up the leaves to see those flowers. That's my only complaint about the wild ginger is you have to get down there on your hands and knees if you want to check out those cool flowers. But beautiful heart-shaped leaves. It's a moderate spreader, not super slow, not super fast. Pretty easy to dig a section and move it around though. So once you got a little patch established, you can start kind of propagating it a bit around and seeing where it likes to be. Good to know. Now I put in some in a wet area last year and I'm glad to know I'll be able to move it around because I really like it so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the point of like, you know, give something two years on the third year. That's when you can say, okay, now I can take a section of you and, and move that to another place. It's very, very true. Uh, sleep creep leaf is what we like to call that in the in the design world is that in the first year, keep in mind, a lot of these things are putting roots down. So you may not see a whole lot going up on top. And then the next year, it just creeps along. And then year three, it just really takes off. So um, some of these things take a little bit of patience to your point. Um, one of the, the, the questions was just expanding on our conversation about moss is, you know, do you talk a little bit about the moss lawns in your book? Yes. So definitely highlight moss lawns and talk about the different choices there. I'm also going to recommend another book uh, by a friend of mine. Her name is Moss and Annie. And the book is from Timber Press and it's all about establishing moss lawns and gardens. I think it's called The Art of Moss Gardening. Um, I'm not sure if I'm remembering the exact title correctly. I hope I am. But once you, you know, get a little your entry foot with my book into ground covers and you start to collect mosses and start to have a little moss lawn, I would say that's your next step is to check out Moss and Annie and her collection and what she's doing. She's located outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Um, and she has a moss, um, uh, I, would, I wouldn't call it a farm, I guess production <laughs> or nursery, um, but she is the expert on establishing moss lawns and gardens. 
fantastic. Well, I put her name in the chat for those because uh, it's sort of a, a an abbreviation, Mossin, uh, yeah, S S I N. Awesome. Yes. Uh, so that people her. can see that. She also has a YouTube channel, it looks like. So. Oh, sorry, Heather. I was just going to say her. She has a real last name, and it's Martin. So Annie Martin. <laughs> if, if you need to actually Google Annie Martin Moss, um, that should come up for you too. Got it. Yep. Uh, and it comes up as Moss and Annie too. So you, you got it. Um, so uh, one other question that I or, or, or thing that I think you make a really great point of just even on the front of the book is that these brown covers really do not require any mowing. So we're avoiding some of the, the gas issues and that are being brought to light as people move to electronic uh, mowers and blowers. No fertilization is necessary, which is really great for those of you who are pollinator gardens. The most recent data is suggesting that the um, artificial uh, fertilizers are, are interfering with the bees' ability to pollinate plants. That's a, a little tip for you. Um, no pesticides, which I think we're all super concerned about as we are number one in childhood and pet cancers. Uh, so consider what you're putting on your lawn and, and on your plants. Uh, so um, I think you've given a great, um, you know, motivation for those of us who are looking to shrink the lawn, perhaps, uh, as you mentioned, that for uh, be able to do other things, thing as much as you and I love to garden, uh, lawn maintenance usually is not high on the list of, of homeowners. So um, are there, um, what, what would you recommend um, in terms of how people can get your book or if they want to learn more about you because they'd like to invite you to speak or um, come and visit uh, maybe for consultation? How do they get a hold of you? Sure, so it's Ground Cover Revolution. You can get it at amazonbookshop.org. Um, you can come to washingtongardener.blogspot.com is my main website for Washington Gardener Magazine, Washington being Washington, D.C. Um, I, I get a lot of people who think that's the West Coast Washington, but we're the, the right coast Washington. And we can, um, be, you can contact me through uh, social media really easily. I'm at WDC Gardener on Twitter, Instagram, uh, even TikTok now and Pinterest. You can follow my uh, I have a board on Pinterest just for ground covers, so that might be a great one for you. And I have our, my weekly podcast called Garden DC, and that's free and available wherever you listen to podcasts, Spotify, Apple, etc., iHeartRadio. And one of the recent um, episodes was on ground covers versus ground covers, and I think that's a great one to dive into if you want to learn more about the topic. Um, so you can check that one out. You can just Google Garden DC, all one word, and then ground covers versus ground covers episode. You can also find that at washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Fantastic. And I have put those in the chat as well. Uh, for those of you who want to save the chat, there are three dots that say um, more over there. You can, uh, you can copy that, um, the chat onto your computer so you can see all of those so that you're not having to write those down very quickly. But um, I really appreciate you being here today and thank you for joining us under the weather. We didn't get a visitation from the garden cats, but we can go to the blog and see them as well. So if you're interested in uh, participating in Cats in the Garden, it's catsinthegarden at blogspot.com that Kathy also uh, runs. But we're super happy to have you here, Kathy, and um, really recommend this book, especially if you want to know more about garden. Uh, the ground covers. This is an excellent resource for any homeowner. It's uh, required reading for the library. So, and I was gonna say, Heather, we just had Mother's Day, but I'm looking towards Father's Day, and all those fathers get gifts like lawn mowers and <laughs> stuff like that. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe your father is ready to convert to ground covers. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a great, great, great suggestion for sure. So. Uh, definitely we'll look into that. But uh, thanks so much for being here and hope you're feeling better soon. Thanks, Heather. Take care. Bye now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>